Hey there, Dan Blewett here. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before we get started, I want to share a little bit about a new project of mine. Early Work is an online strength training program created as a collaboration between myself and one of my good friends, Coach Andrew Sachs. So in the Early Work program, obviously my YouTube skills are, uh, are coming in handy here. You're going to get 4K quality videos, great audio of me and Coach Sachs teaching every exercise in the program, workouts change monthly, and he and I collaborate to build each new month as the program changes and evolves in season, off season, just trying to make sure players peak and are at their best at every point of the year. So between the two of us, we have 20 plus years of experience training baseball players. I was a baseball academy owner, strength coach. Andrew is still a strength coach, owns his own facility here in the Baltimore area. And our program has three different plans, one for individuals, one for families, so that includes your extended family, and one for teams. So no matter who you are and who you're looking for a program for, we've got a plan for you. So if you want to try the program out, we offer a 14-day free trial so you can sign up, get to work, try it out in your local gym, see if it fits your life and your goals and all that good stuff. Obviously, we stand by it. We've been doing this a long time. So give it a shot today. Try the Early Work Strength Program. We know you're going to love it. All right, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods. I'm your host, Dan Blewett, and on today's episode, we're gonna cover three topics. Number one, pitching velocity ranges and peaks and how those sort of interact with each other. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about pitching velocity. Number two, off-season weekly throwing, what the general breakdown looks like. And lastly, aggressiveness uh, in game. So this is not gonna be pitcher specific, but should you play angry, play calm? Should you be contemplative? Should you be pumped up? We'll kind of dive into all that. All right, so first topic here today, let's cover pitching velocity ranges. This is a big misconception and I did a, I, I did a really in-depth video on YouTube, so I'll link to that in the show notes as well. But basically, I think a lot of pitchers, they think that they can reach their, their peak speed every time they pitch. I think parents expect that a lot as well. And I got a, a recent comment actually on the softball side, but he basically said, hey, my, my daughter, you know, she could hit. I can't remember what the number was. I'll just give you a number. But, you know, she could she could throw 55 overhand. She just hit that recently. But now she's only hitting 53 or 54. And, you know, I just don't know why she can't be as aggressive every time. And I got the, I've got i gotten that same question over and over and over on the baseball side as well. You know, my son can throw 90, but, you know, why does some days he throw 88 or 87? My son throws 75, but some, day he, some days he's throwing 72. And the answer is that's, that's just pretty normal. I mean, it's, it's funny how strict of a standard we hold uh, pitchers to, but like with anything else, you're just not at 100% every single day, whether that's your focus at work, whether that's your running pace, if you're a runner, whether that's how much weight you lift in the weight room, you know, like your sprinting speed, like it, literally everything. We're we're asking pitchers to throw it exactly 100 percent and not ever drop to like 98 percent, which is a really high standard to 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 reach every time. So if you throw 80 miles per hour, you're at the point where one percentage point is one and a quarter miles per hour, right? That's the the simple math there. So how can we expect you to never be at 98.75%, right? 98.75% is probably more normal than 100% is. And I think we all sort of know that to be true. So the big thing, and again, I would encourage you to, to watch the video in my in the show notes here on YouTube because I overlaid some examples of how Max Scherzer's velocity ranges and how Aroldis Chapman's velocity ranges. But the take home here is expect your son, or if you're a pitcher yourself listening here, expect yourself to be within a four mile per hour range and the older you get the more narrow that range becomes but that's still the range exhibited by big leaguers when you average out all their starts so sure you might watch Rawls chapman pitch one night and he's 98 to 100 which is 98 99 and 100 mile per hour pitches so that's a two mile per hour spread you know there's still going to be nights where he's 96 to 99 and 96 to 102 and 97 to, to 101 it's you just don't catch every fastball perfectly. You just don't give up, you know, your your 100% effort in every single pitch. There's just a lot a lot of variables. Sometimes it depends on the count, sometimes it depends on whether you're really competing hard. Like I know I've got to throw this fastball by a guy, and that's when I tend to hit my peak velocity 
or sometimes you're too tense or you're too you're too loose or you had a really rough week and you didn't eat as much as normal or you had a workout and you're kind of tired from it there's so many variables that could just again snip off one percent two percent three percent and now you're down a couple miles per hour so it's, it's just important to remember that unless your week is perfectly consistent week to week which that only becomes normal when i think you get to college and pro ball where guys are very consistent but either even then there's inconsistencies like in the minor leagues guys are on a you know they have 14 bus 14 hour bus rides from one town to the next one week then the next week they're home for a whole week so their sleep is going to be significantly different one week than the next their eating habits are going to be different one week to the next and they still are very consistent with their their on the field routine and in general the things that they do but they can't control a lot of those variables again like long bus rides you know access to weightlifting equipment and stuff like that on the road the food that they get to eat when they're on the road versus at home all that stuff so it's just important to remember any of those little variables will again snip off a mile per hour or two and that's going to make a big difference and when you're younger and i've seen this over and over and over young kids don't know how to throw the same exact effort on every single pitch so if you're 14 yeah your son is not going to throw it exactly 99 percent every single pitch he's going to throw he's going to ease off someone he's afraid he's going to ease off someone he's you know uh behind the count there's just gonna be a lot of situations mentally that affect the output of velocity so again the takeaway here is when you hit a, a new a new peak number which is great it's exciting especially the big like 10 you know 10 mile per hour mi milestones like 70 80 90 you know 100 of course no one listening to this has ever hit 100 but you know when you hit those new milestones it's not that you're now going to throw every pitch there it's not that you're not going to throw even many pitches you might not even touch that number the next time out which i'm sure is disappointing but it's realistic the reality is that your your average has just shifted up a little higher so if you're throwing 78 to 82 and now you hit an 83 there's just going to start to be more 79s 80s 81s 82s now and still a couple 83s but everything's just going to shift up your range a little bit and it's not going to be the case that you're not going to start pumping tons and tons of 83s that's going to take time as well so just remember the range is kind of like a bell curve so you're not going to throw too many at the bottom of your range you're not going to throw that many at the top of your range either so you know how many pitches at 105 has a chapman thrown his whole life not that many right um and for a pitcher that peaks at 100 he might throw you know if he throws a thousand pitches in a in a season he might throw 50 at 100 because that's his absolute peak and he might only throw 50 pitches at 97 if that's his seat if that's his basement and he might might throw 900 pitches at 98 or 99 spread between the two and again that's how the velocity range works so that's just a really important that i think thing I, I think that most people don't understand that they really need to to buy into because especially for parents you don't want to put extra pressure on your kids expecting them to now reach this new number every time out and players you don't want to do that to yourself either it's just exhausting and it's demoralizing you know celebrate you know new velocity peaks but don't expect yourself to hit that new number every time out All right, topic number two today, let's talk about off-season weekly throwing. Now, once you're starting to get more ramped up for the season, which is sort of the what I'll talk about today, this is your overall weekly outlook. Number one, you'll throw two bullpens a week typically with probably three or four days in between. You'll have one to two off days. You'll have two catch days and then one like long toss or velocity day, depending on your situation. So if you live in Minneapolis, it's probably going to be just like an indoor sort of throw into a net day, like in a batting tunnel in an indoor facility. And if you're in a warm climate place, you might be able to go out there and actually long toss, stretch it out, whatever you want to do. Or you could still do the, the throw into a net sort of uh, velocity pitching drills kind of day. And that's sort of what I called them um, back in my academy. You know, it wasn't necessarily weighted balls because we really didn't do weighted ball training for the last five years of my academy. I just shifted away from it. But what we would do is just a series of drills that were personalized for each kid. They would do some running crow hops. They would do some full speed pitching into a net and just working on fixing their mechanics and, and also just getting their arm some higher speed work. That wasn't necessarily a bullpen because when you're in a bullpen, the goal is to throw strikes, throw the ball where you want it and mix up all your pitches, all that stuff. And on that velocity sort of day, it was more like, let's work on your mechanics at a higher speed and getting comfortable with some of those things and also also just getting your arms some conditioning and some comfort at higher speeds 
So of course the other the other two days here are important or two types of days. That's off days number one. So you should throw when you're starting to get in shape. And again, I'm not covering the whole scope of off season training right now. I'm really covering like when you're starting to get in shape. This is more like January, February, and you're ready to start throwing off the mound. So that assumes you've probably done at least eight weeks of ramping up throwing prior to that. But one to two off days. So if you want to throw six days a week, that's fine. Or you want to throw five days a week, that's also fine. But again, two bullpens, two catch days, one long toss or velocity day. And then if you added a sixth a day, because that only counts for five, then you would probably add another catch day in there. And a catch day is going to be working on spinning all your different pitches, work on your mechanics, but you're at a low intensity. This is like 50 to 70% effort. So catch days need to stay catch days. And a lot, and a big problem with young pitchers is they're very, and this is even into college and pro pitchers too, is they become very insecure about their velocity. And so every time they throw a ball, they want to reprove to themselves that they still throw hard. And that's not a good thing. Like your body does need rest and you do need to throttle up and throttle down. And some days of the week, you just need to not go hard, but do throw a baseball a bunch. And, uh, and so spinning all your off speed stuff is important working on your mechanics do a flat ground at the end which is your your partner gets down and you throw a kneecap the kneecap on both sides all that sort of stuff so in the in the scope of all right i've gotten eight weeks throwing in i'm sort of built up i'm ready to get off the mound we have like four to eight weeks left for the season two bullpens monday thursday or monday friday you know an off day in between a catch day in between and then maybe one of those velocity days in between or after The second bullpen is going to depend on how you feel and how you want to do it. But that's the overall scope of of weekly throwing. When you're into the mound phase of your offseason planning, you should not be throwing three bullpens a week. And if you really want to be ready for the season, two uh, less than two bullpens. So one bullpen or zero bullpens is not enough either. So you do need a transition, but I don't think there's really room for three bullpens a week. Um, If you want to do one really low, really low effort and cut out the long toss or velocity day so be it that's fine as long as the the effort is actually lower a lot of again a, young, a lot of young pitchers don't have a good time uh, have, a, have a good meter where they're not good at metering their velocity and actually throwing slower say in something like that so you have to know yourself so if you can't throw less than 90 percent off the mound then you can't do that third bullpen day so it should be two bullpen days at you know 90 to 100 percent effort and then that third one, if you want to throw off the mound a third time, it, you just really have to control yourself and go 50%, 60%, and that's about it to make it sort of mirror one of your catch days. So hopefully that helps. If you have any questions, um, I have a free throwing program on YouTube and on my website. You can always check those out, or you can leave a comment below or shoot me an email. All right, last topic for today. Should you play angry? Should you play calm? Should you be pumped up? Should you be, you know, really going through your mental checklist, your your playbook? So this is going to be highly personal, and I, I hate answering questions where like, oh, it, it always depends, because everything depends, right? But one of the interesting things about one of my other new endeavors, I have another podcast called The Walk-Up Song. I'll link to it below. It's a Spotify-only playlist where we have guests on and they share sort of like the songs of their journey and the songs that they would walk up to uh, and some of the songs they get their mind right for a game. And it's been really interesting actually having even not even that many guests on thus far, just talking about, you know, what each player is looking for in their mindset. Like some players know that they're pretty, uh, pretty amped up people already and their walk up song, they're trying to calm themselves down. So maybe it's like something reggae or something really mellow because they want to not get too amped up because they know they play their best when they're just a little bit more chill and relaxed and, and focused that way. Whereas other players, uh, and I'd probably fall into this category who are kind of relaxed and contemplative and a little more chill, sometimes want to be a little more pumped up. And so they hear this like, you know, bass heavy song or this like hard rock or whatever. And it really just gets them a little more jacked up and like ready to fight sort of thing. So it, it's highly dependent. I think it takes a lot of self-awareness and the best players are usually very self-aware, even if some of them aren't like huge, deep thinkers. Um, self-awareness is pretty, uh, pretty common to all good ball players. And I think figuring out what minds that you want to cultivate is really important. And there's no clear way to do it. Like I can't tell you what you should do, but what you should do is listen to different types of music. Um, 
you know, kind of think about what kind of player you are, you know, think about how you felt when you had some of your best games where you all jacked up and just ready, ready to fight everybody on the field. And that makes you really, really good. Like you're more aggressive, you're less fearful, you're more confident because you're sort of like put puff on your chest out and ready to go. You know, maybe that works for you and that's completely okay. Or maybe that's a little bit how you are naturally and you need something to kind of like even you out a little bit. It just depends. But I think it's a good question to have with, uh, a little good conversation to have with yourself because you won't know this until you start to tinker a little bit and, you know, experiment with your pregame music or whatever it is that you do in the pregame um, part of your day to sort of get your mind right and be ready to compete. So, you know, there's more mental training stuff and mindset talk out there on the Internet than ever because people are recognizing how important it is. But there's also a lot of uh, noise and there's a lot of, I think, junk advice and just like people repackaging the same advice and just like different terms and just trying to tweet out something that's the same but new every day. Um, but really what it comes down to is knowing yourself. It comes down to knowing yourself and to know yourself, you have to start to get to know yourself and take some time and think about who you are as a player and what fuels you and when you play well and when you don't play well. A lot of players don't really take the time to sit down and think about that. And I've had a lot of conversations with players over the years where I asked them, I'm like, how do you get outs as a pitcher? Blank stare. What kind of hitter are you? Blank stare. You know, what kind of player are you when you're at your best? Blank stare. You know, it's just like general questions. Um, you're not going to have answers to it if you never thought about it, even though you could probably like, and I basically end up sort of like coaxing players. Well, you do this, right? You do this, right? You do this, right? And then like, oh yeah, I guess I am kind of like a scrappy, you know, long at bats, hit the ball the other way. Yeah, I get it. Like they, they, they kind of know who they are. They just sometimes need to be shown it, but they also need, I think, to spend more time sitting with it to try to get into that, uh, again, that self-awareness where then they can say, okay, if this is the kind of player I am, then maybe this should be my pregame process so that I can cultivate this type of mindset. All right. So hopefully that helps. Mindset's really important and knowing who you are as a player is equally important. That's it for today's episode of Dear Baseball Gods. I'd greatly appreciate it if you'd subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget, in the notes of this show, you'll find links to my pitching manual, Pitching Isn't Complicated, my memoir, Dear Baseball Gods, my online video pitching courses, and my new baseball strength training program called Early Work. You can sign up right now for a free 14-day trial to Early Work, and if you're interested in one of my online courses, you can save 20% on any one of them using the promo code BASEBALLGODS. Thanks again for listening and stay on your hustle. You never know who's watching.